Hello and welcome to True Crime Podcast, produced by Ukraine Crisis Media Center and the Hybrid Warfare Team. Our podcast is dedicated to tackling Russian hybrid threats and the tools of influence Russian propaganda employs. We will kick off this first episode discussing Russian oppositionists and what is wrong with them, focusing on some of the most famous Russian oppositionists. Maxim Katz. Today it seems fitting to start with Maxim Katz. Born in Moscow, however, has spent a period of his life in Israel. After his return to Russia, he took an interest in urban planning and public society, eventually becoming a public figure and a city deputy of one of Moscow's districts. He defines himself as a liberal and part of the Russian opposition. He runs a popular political YouTube channel in which he is the host and so over Ukraine and Europe, he is a well-known figure. Nevertheless, his statements are often contradictory and harmful to Ukraine. Here are some examples. Upon answering a question on Twitter, What should the Russian opposition do now? After the full-scale invasion, he answered, The Russian opposition owes nothing to anyone, especially Ukrainians. With this message, he shows a lack of empathy for the victims, Ukrainians, of an unprovoked aggressive war on a peaceful, sovereign nation. Moreover, it shows his unwillingness to answer for the crimes committed by his state and fellow citizens. Also, he doesn't shy away from resorting to what aboutism. Here is his tweet from September 19, during the Ukrainian Kharkiv counteroffensive. Horrible footage from Donetsk is everywhere today. Apparently, a Ukrainian projectile hit a store and 13 deaths are reported. Peaceful people went to the shop and ended up dead. It's terrible. I hope this case will be investigated. This tweet was intended not only to shift the emphasis from the failed defense by the occupiers, but also to cause a discussion about both sides being guilty. We also note that there is a contradiction between the statements regarding the future of Russia. On the one hand, he says that everyday Russians can't do anything about their regime, being so-called helpless. Whereas on the other hand, he claims that only Russians, Russians themselves, can defeat Putin. And there should be no external intervention. Maxim tells that we need to hope for the poor soldier's mother for an uprising. Also on Twitter in 2014, he confirmed his position on Crimea, saying that it is now currently part of the Russian Federation, and so he doesn't see any issues with Navalny's well-known phrase, Crimea is not a sandwich, and it should be returned only after a new referendum. Constantly shifting the role of the victim onto oneself and simultaneously defending Russian sovereignty creates the illusion of a Russian opposition. Maxim Katz constantly abdicates himself and Russians from guilt and tells his audience to wait for the so-called natural regime change. Leonid Volkov. Next in today's episode is Leonid Volkov, director of the Anti-Corruption Foundation and a close associate of Alexei Navalny. He was also the head of Navalny's campaign headquarters, co-founder of the Internet Protection Society, and subsequently a liberal and oppositionist of the Putin regime. Since Alexei Navalny is in prison, he supervises all financial operations. He supported Ukraine's Euromaidan, and at the beginning of the full-scale invasion, he began to cover the events of the war. But what is his vision of the geopolitical situation in the world, you ask? And what narratives does he bring to society? Well, in early June 2023, Leonid published a video on his YouTube channel in which he repeatedly emphasizes that there cannot be any format of a collective responsibility. After all, in each case, it is a specific person or people who are responsible for each of these crimes, thus denying Russians any responsibility and the only ones to blame are Putin and the Russian military. And at the same time, he has no problem saying how the shelling of Shebininko in the Belgorod region is a Ukrainian war crime. Just like the previous oppositionist, Maxim Katz, he blurs the line between the victim and the aggressor. Moreover, he claims that if Ukraine does not punish those responsible for these shellings, it will not be able to become a successful state. 
At the same time, he questions the operations of the Legion, Freedom of Russia, and the Russian Volunteer Corps, asserting that these are Ukrainian formations and they have nothing to do with Russia, because this is not the Russian path of resistance, he says. Next. It would be wrong for us not to mention how Leonid reacted to Russia's explosion of Kakovka Dam. After doing his own investigation on the matter, he said, If I had to bet money, I would bet that the dam collapsed on its own because it was already damaged. This position aligns him with a part of Russian society that doesn't know what is going on, telling how it is impossible to know without a proper investigation, which, by the way, is underway. However, without Russia's participation, for obvious reasons. Russian propaganda often uses this as one of the tools of manipulation. Interestingly, as of now, many more facts have appeared, which only confirm the dam was indeed mined and blown up by Russian troops. However, Leonid did not add further comments to these discoveries. How surprising. Furthermore, in a 2019 interview with BBC Russia, Leonid was asked, Who does Crimea belong to? He replied, Crimea should be Crimean and distinct from both Russia and Ukraine. It calls for the establishment of a new type of political independent framework from the ground up by the next generation of politicians capable of resolving the Crimean issue. Therefore, five years after the annexation, the Russian opposition was still demanding that Crimea not be returned to Ukraine. Leonid tries to appear as a sincere oppositionist, but his statements, past and present, often contradict this. The consistency of some of his comments with central thesis of Russian propaganda is also ambiguous. Ilya Valamov Last but not least, Ilya Valamov. This Russian public figure is primarily known for his urban blogging activities, At the same time, he has, over the last few years, attempted to play a political role. He actively participates in the so-called Russian oppositionist activities. He also is a political commentator on his YouTube channel. His work was quite popular among Ukrainian viewers due to the urban theme. But after the annexation of Crimea by Russia and his visit to the occupied peninsula, his popularity fell. So what else makes Ilya Valamov stand out among Russian opposition figures. On the anniversary of Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, he published the video, The Year of War. What has this done to Russia and how did we survive it? This video caused huge outrage among Ukrainians because the blogger himself suffered in no way from the war in comparison to Ukrainians. We can also mention his publications about Galkov Dam. He, like Volkov, calls it a breach of the dam and offers the opinion that he is not sure who blew it up. Also in his videos, Valamov often tries to create an idea of an artificial closeness between Russia and Ukraine. In one video he said, Much of Ukraine's industry is in decline because they broke ties with Russia after 2014. Actually, following the Russian annexation of Crimea in 2014, Ukraine's economy did indeed suffer. GDP dropped from $190 billion in 2013 to $90 billion in 2016. But this is primarily due to the war in Donbass, the industrial region rich in coal resources and metallurgy was heavily impacted. Ukraine has since pursued reforms and sought to reduce its dependence on Russia, but the path to recovery and sustained growth remains challenging. Moreover, his position on Crimea is a lot more clear-cut than any of the others, repeatedly stating that Crimea is ours, just like the Russian prosecutor of Crimea, Natalia Boklonska, says. He justified this by the fact that he is Crimean and he knows the mood of the local population. Okay, so to wrap up our exploration of the pseudo-liberalism within the Russian opposition, It becomes evident that their proclaimed imperialistic inclinations mar liberal values. Despite their claims of championing democracy and human rights, certain members of the Russian opposition have shown a willingness to align with imperial interests, which raise questions about their authenticity as true liberal proponents. 
The strategic emphasis on victimhood and occasional collaboration with the state propaganda blurs the line between genuine liberalism and hidden agendas. As we delve deeper into the complexities of Russian politics, it is crucial for our audience to critically analyse these actions and rhetoric of the Russian opposition and remain cautious of potential ulterior motives. By developing a nuanced understanding of the pseudo-liberalism displayed by the Russian opposition, we empower ourselves as informed observers to navigate the intricate and manipulative world of Russian politics and discern the voices genuinely working towards propaganda agendas. Those ones are true Russian oppositionists.